Uh, we're going to talk about the post-election and what it means for education. Uh, an important topic for all of us, not only because some of us work in education, is because so many of us are moms, dads, nieces, nephews, cousins, but we're all taxpayers. And we've got to make sure that we have one of those important uh, domestic issues in place, and that's education. And so we've put together a panel, as we have done uh, after previous elections, of people who actually have a few ideas on this subject of education, just a few. And some of them are actually vested in this issue. And so that will be equally interesting to discuss. And so what I'm going to do is move from my right to left. Uh, we'll introduce everyone, and then we will have a discussion. Uh, we've got a lot of time here. Uh, we know that many of you come peppered with great questions, and I have a few in here as well. Um, I, what I would like to say is this is going to be a great opportunity for us to do some great things for family and kids. But how it actually happens, we'll have to find out from our, uh, our, our uh, speakers. So first, next to me is my colleague Andy Schmerich, who is now, glad to say, a resident fellow here at AEI. Uh, Andy, uh, some years ago, was a founder as well as a manager of Bellwether, uh, an organization that's done great work in education. But he also has experience in state government, uh, having worked for the New Jersey Department of Education. And he's also an author of a book, so he's got uh, very great opinions on this subject. Next to him is Catherine Stevens, another AEI colleague. Uh, she's a scholar in the area of early childhood education. She's also worked uh, at the practical level in working with families and students, particularly in New York City, to provide better opportunities. And uh, we've heard a few things about early childhood education come up during the campaign, and so it would be interesting to see what you have to say. Uh, one of my colleagues who's not an AEI person, but we're glad to have him on board, is Scott uh, Sarg uh, Sargud, Sargrad, excuse me, who's the man managing director of K-12 education at the Center for American Progress. Uh, prior to that, he actually worked uh, in the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education in the U.S. Department of Education. And so he's actually seen the internal workings of a federal department and what it will look like. And so look forward to uh, hearing from Isma as well. We've got uh, Jason Delisle, who's also an AEI colleague. He is a higher education expert, particularly in the area of uh, student finance uh, and, you know, and affordability. Uh, and, uh, and debt was a subject that we heard a great deal about in the campaign. Uh, he's seen this not only as a scholar, but he also worked on Capitol Hill, and so he's seen the inner workings of government and how this will play. Uh, we also have someone who many of you know, Allison Klein, who works for Education Week. She's written a great deal about K-12 education, keeps a lot of us informed on what to think about education, but also what other people are thinking about the subject. So glad to have you here. And last but not least, in the high seat on the other side is, uh, is Rick Hess. <laughs> is Rick Hess, who is the Director of Education Policy Studies here at AEI, uh, one of the nation's leading thinkers on school reform, not only higher K-12, but also higher ed. Uh, he's had a few things to say, not only in books, in blogs, uh, but also in some recent writings about what education will look like as we move forward. And so I want to thank Rick for again pulling together a very uh, good, great uh, group of people to talk about this. So let's start off. We woke up a new morning and found out that Trump is now president-elect of the United States. Uh, a number of people threw confetti, a number of people uh, held on to tissues. <laughs> and so there has been a, supposedly a divide. And now after every election, the winners have certain things to do, those who did not have other things to do. But as a nation, we have to find a way of coming together. Now that we have a, a new administration, I'm going to just uh, go across the board and would really like you to just tell me what surprised you most about the outcome of this election? We'll start with Andy and work our way across. Uh, a, a couple things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Maybe that question? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the polls had it wrong. Um, all of the polls had it wrong, maybe other than uh, you know, Carlin Bowman, who works here, and Henry Olson. Very few people saw this thing coming. And what I'm most interested in is not only does it seem to speak to um, you know, the presidential election, but there's something underlying it, like the zeitgeist, like the spirit of the times. And I'm trying to put some pieces together here. Why is it that not only Trump won, but why is it the Massachusetts ballot initiative went down um, on the charter school cap? Um, some Senate races and some gubernatorial races. Okay. It's um, the the map turned red, and it was already red, but it's even more so now. Catherine, 
Uh, well, as it uh, happens, I actually predicted that this was going to happen, so I'm not surprised <laughs> that he won. Um, two things d did surprise me uh, prior to the election and now after. One is just the degree of out-of-touchness um, that to me was actually quite obvious that resulted in the fact that everybody is so surprised. That's the mm. first thing. Second thing that actually I have to say is surprising me is the degree of drama uh, that people are responding to this uh, with. I mean, just like like sobbing and crying and canceling meetings and staying in bed. And you know, this is the deal. It's like we live in a country with our citizens, our fellow citizens, and their people. And I am hoping that this drives us to do a much better idea, uh, job of trying to understand who we live in our country with and, and finding common ground, because uh, that's the only way we're sure. going to be able to move forward. Scott, what do you think? Uh, so as somebody who woke up not super happy this very morning, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think one of the things that I was most surprised about um, was just the, the level of, um, I think, anger and mistrust that this election brought out in a lot of folks. And I think I totally agree that we need to figure out a way to kind of come together here. But I think there, there's something behind a lot of that that is also kind of a, a mistrust of I want to say truth and facts. And I, I'm sort of wondering what, why that is and how we move forward from that. And I do think that sort of talking about education is maybe a way to, to start that because there, there's a lot of places in the country that voted for Trump that have really been struggling with education in particular. And I think um, you know, Mike Petrilli had a piece uh, yesterday that I think spoke to this really well. But um, we have to do a, a better job of improving education across the entire country and try to get past some of this mistrust uh, of, of truth and facts. So there, there are things that are true, there are things that are facts, and we need to figure out how to make sure that that, that can come through to people. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess, you know, I've, I've been surprised that higher education w was a big issue in this election. It, that's, a, <laughs> that's sort of a new development. Uh, if you go back and try to look at the higher education platforms of other presidential candidates in the past, um, you, you won't find very much. Um, so I, th I thought that was pretty surprising, um, although um, some candidates had a lot more to say on it than, than others. Um, so. Mm -hmm. awesome. so I'm in the media, um, so we're all very surprised. <laughs> um, I, spent, I stayed late at the office on Monday pre-writing a bunch of Clinton blog posts, um, Clinton wins blog posts, mm -hmm. um, what ESSA would look like under Clinton, you know, what the innovative assessment pilot would look like under Clinton. <laughs> so that was a lot of wasted work. <laughs> uh, you know, other than the obvious, I was totally surprised because I'd expected Scott to come in here doing one of these triumphal dances. <laughs> <laughs> so that, uh, the other thing is, is a surprise. This is the first time, I, 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 would, I would not have guessed this, this is the first time since that the Republicans have had the presidency and a majority in both houses of Congress since 1928. Mm -hmm. That's a, kind of a surprise to me. <laughs> Wait. Yes. Yeah. Nope, no, 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 50-50 and Cheney broke the tie until you had the flip. Right. It's the first time Republicans have 51 senators, right. 218 seats in the House, okay. and the presidency since 1928. In one word, tell me, give me one word for you, what you think about all of this, and one word for how you think the country's feeling. Let me start? Yep. Uh, I'm just curious. I'm curious? And world, how's the world America feeling? <coughs> Uber curious. <laughs> <laughs> one word. I'm feeling hopeful. Hopeful? And I think the country is feeling uh, I'll take all. Uh. Uh, yeah, okay, yep. uh, that was good. Uh, I'm going to go with sh shock and shock. For, yep. uh, I, I think waiting and waiting. We're waiting to see what, what this all means still. Mm -hmm. So I'm a reporter. I have no opinions. Um, I hope the country will read my stories. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so read, baby, read. Uh, yeah. Got it. Got it. It's going to be good for circulation. Come on. Uh, yeah, kind of. Um, <laughs> uh, me, I'm OK. Uh, country, <laughs> angst-driven. What was that? Angst-driven. With every new administration, you have to come up with an agenda. You've got a campaign agenda, and then you're elected, and it's a real agenda. People who create charter schools every day will tell you, we wrote a charter school, it was approved, and then the children arrived. Changed everything. 
<laughs> What's the education agenda for the Trump administration? Can we throw you a lifeline? <laughs> Gerard? No. <laughs> uh, that is the uh, $70 billion question. Um, how are the resources of the U.S. Department of Education going to be used in this administration? Um, based on what he has said to date, you would think that some school choice initiative will be part of it. Um, Republicans his recently in Congress have been less amenable to school choice stuff than they were, say, 10 or 20 years ago. Um, if I had to, I would probably say the biggest initiative we're likely to see is some sort of pause, rewind on some of the ESSA implementation stuff, like the regulatory package. Yeah. But what that looks like, I'm not sure yet. Uh, what I'm hoping um, is that, and I'm actually expecting, is that a Trump administration is going to recognize what many of you in this room know, which is early childhood is the foundation of educational opportunity. So if we don't get the foundation right, uh, it's very difficult to fix that later down the line. The question is, uh, how do we do that? Um, and I would expect uh, a Trump administration to be focusing very strongly on, on families and what families need, empowering families to choose what's best for them sure. and, their, and their kids, and in supporting work, uh, it, it promoting pr child development and advancing parents' ability to work at the same time. Family piece, good point. I, I think it's a total mystery. I mean, there, there's no chance that, besides maybe one of us on this stage, anybody knows anything about what's going to happen. And I, I think the, the early childhood piece is, is interesting, although uh, Ivanka Trump has only talked about child care, not actually sort of early childhood education in the same way. Um, I, I think on the K, in the K-12 space, it will be some time before any of this gets figured out. And the ESSA plans are going to be due soon, and I think mostly that's just going to sort of roll through. Um, I do think there might be some, some rollback of the, the regulations, but there are some things in ESSA that states just have to do, okay. um, and I think that'll probably continue. Uh, well, Gerard, you know I'm an insider. Um, and Trump is an outsider. <laughs> so it would be really suspicious if I knew what the higher education agenda was for the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. um, and so I really don't know because I'm an insider. Um, but, but I think there are some, there are some really big opportunities that, that um, the insiders on both the left and the right in Washington have um, you know, not really taken and not done much with uh, in higher education. And one is student loan defaults. There are eight million people in default on their student loans in this country, right? And that number, that number is a million more than it was a year ago. Uh, and and, and it's, it's only climbed under the Obama administration. And we have, but we have 5% unemployment. But student loan defaults are rising like crazy. And so, and, but no real set of ready-made solutions for something like that. So I think that's a place where the Trump administration could say, hey, we need to figure something out here. We need a much better approach. We need to find a way to, to solve some of this problem and move these people out of default. And Trump's got extensive experience in bankruptcy. It's true. <laughs> it's true. He is, he is the king of debt, uh, and he knows uh, something about how to get out of it, I guess. <laughs> um. So I would say since 1989 with the Charlottesville summit, we've seen presidency after presidency, administration after administration, Republican and Democrat, make education a priority. And I think ESSA definitely rolled a lot back to the states anyway, and I do think that that, uh, Scott was saying this kind of in our quick conversation beforehand, um, this is only gonna accelerate that process. Um, and kind of piggybacking on what Scott said about the ESSA plans and there's certain things that states have to do. Yes, there's certain things that the law says states have to do, <laughs> But um, we saw much of NCLB was not enforced. Um, for instance, the requirement that um, schools distribute highly qualified teachers fairly between poor and less poor schools. Andy was mentioning to me yesterday um, the requirement on tutoring, I believe, or was that you or maybe somebody else I talked to was mentioning that the requirement on tutoring um, was not, uh, not enforced. So I'm wondering what parts of this law, I think it was inevitable, even under a Clinton administration, some things were gonna go sort of sure. by the wayside or enforcement would look different. But I think that it's, that's, that's really something I'll be watching closely and what the reaction is yep. um, when things aren't enforced. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I won't pretend to have a clue what's, what Trump actually thinks about any of this. And I think it's unclear kind of how his advisor shuffle is gonna work itself out. Mm -hmm. But I, I think there's a couple things that are almost inevitable. Um, one, to Allison's point, the Obama administration has been very proud of its pen and phone strategy. And anybody who came in from the other party was going to see a lot of stuff that had been done, not by law, 
not through regular order, but by people freelancing at the White House and, the, and in Mr. Departments. And I think not just Trump administration, but any Republican administration was going to say, well, geez, there's a lot of stuff here that's not the law of the land that we're going to unwind. And I think that stuff will start happening immediately. To Allison's point, I also think um, not only do the Bushies not worry about um, enforcing NCLB to letter of the law, but I think the last eight years have been a wonderful lesson uh, in the joys of freelancing and not worrying about exactly what laws say, but having more fun with what one feels like and pretending laws say. I can't imagine why that would stop just because Democrats leave office. So I think, um, I think we're going to see a fair bit of that probably um, in a Department of Ed. Uh, and then the second thing is, look, HEA is up. Uh, Virginia Fox is going to become chair in the House. Her passion is higher ed. Uh, Senator Alexander has made clear that he'd love to move on higher ed. Um, there's, you know, a lot of uh, idea work that has been done. So I, I would think with ESSA in the rearview mirror, uh, probably tackling early childhood through the tax code, the big, you know, if you're going to make a big statutory play mm -hmm. in the first, next couple of years, it's going to be higher ed. When, when people go into the White House and they say we have a mandate from the people, and one mandate that some people take away from this election is we need something radically different. We don't want a traditional insider approach to the work. What can a Trump administration do in education that's not an insider perspective, that's just radically different than what we've seen? I th it's all about personnel, I think, at this point. Okay. Um, Rick has done a really good job of writing about the difference between big R reform and small R reform, one being like, I'm a technocrat, I know what's best, I'm going to reform you. The other is like you create the environment so other people can do things. Um, you free things up, you decentralize. And um, one possible outcome of this election is that uh, President-elect Trump picks, for example, a state superintendent or a former governor to be secretary of education whose mindset is we need to do good education stuff and that is not synonymous with Uncle Sam needs to tell us how to do good education stuff. And so if you have a secretary of education who thinks that things can get done in the states and then he or she staffs the department with people who are not freelancing, who are not writing regulations thinking that we inside the beltway know what the right answer is, um, there may not be a headline of Trump administration does X, Y, and Z. It's a hundred different micro things that are enabled by the federal government backing up and just having this posture of saying we want great things to happen, but this happens through the little platoons of society or through the um, laboratories of democracy, states and communities. Yeah, I think what's unique about early childhood is that it is still a market, largely a market-driven, decentralized sector. So it's less about kind of trying to figure out how to dismantle that or, or shift it as, as building on it, um, utilizing it. So some of the, the best models across the country uh, that have been quite marginalized are ones, for example, in providing scholarships to parents, dis targeting disadvantaged kids, providing providing scholarships to parents that enable them to choose what's right for their kid as opposed to promoting, for example, that the kid is expanding pre-K for four-year-olds. So I think there's some good models out there that have not gotten enough attention, and I'm hoping that this is going to give us an opportunity to really highlight some of those as a, as a model for the rest of the country. Uh, so the first thing is that I guess I would be careful in talking about too much of a mandate uh, because fewer people actually voted for President-elect Trump than voted for <laughs> Secretary Clinton. So I would just say the mandate is kind of a tough word to, throw, to talk about. Um, in terms of sort of what some radical changes might be, I mean, the, the thing that is possible, the, the thing he has said on the stump, right, is get rid of the Department of Education. Like that, that's radical, and that would be shaking things up. I don't think that's actually going to happen, um, but I think the, the risk is a, a significant rollback of its actual roles and responsibilities, <coughs> and the federal role in, in sort of protection for some of the historically underserved groups. And I think if that happens, that's a huge risk. Uh, and whether it's OCR enforcement or just in enforcing the, the existing laws in ESSA, um, I, I think that a, a, could be a real problem. But I, I'm hopeful that that's not something that happens and that we see sort of, uh, some of the things that Jill are talking about of just a, a different approach to education, um, which you know, could could work and, and sure. could not. Uh, well, I, I think the you know there is an opportunity to do something big and radical uh, on student loans. Um, it was a plan that actually um, Jeb Bush uh, announced as part of his when he was running in the in the primaries. 
um, and it basically he would scrap you would scrap the entire federal student loan program and system the way it's designed now, and replace the whole thing with basically a line of credit. And for every ten thousand dollars you draw down on your line of credit, you're signing up to pay back one percent of your income on your income taxes as a surcharge for the next 25 years. So there's no more loans, there's no more balances, there's no more interest rates. You know, all this, should the interest rate be 4%, should people be able to refinance? All that goes away with this. There's no more defaults, because they aren't loans, you can't default on it, you're just paying it on your taxes. There's no more student loan servicers. I mean, this is a really big idea, and it gets at this issue of the 8 million people in default, and all the anxiety people have over their debt. So, um, certainly getting rid of the department, which doesn't look like it would be a hard thing to do, um, would be very radical. But also there was, um, folks who watched the debate over ESSA probably remember there were a package of amendments um, that Republicans wanted to at least get the chance to vote on um, in order to pass the House uh, version of the bill through. Um, one of those was the A-plus Act, um, which was more or less written by um, the folks at uh, the Heritage Foundation with people in Congress, obviously. Um, and it would allow states to basically opt out of a, a whole host of federal requirements, certainly accountability, um, and but still receive federal money. And I wonder if we might see that, you know, block grants, that sort of thing um, revisited. Um, another amendment, and this is certainly one to watch, was one for um, Title I portability. Um, there was a version of public school Title I portability, um, originally in the House version of ESSA. It got stripped out in conference, um, partly because the Obama administration, I believe, insisted on that. Um, and so I would not be surprised, certainly um, Luke Messer, who um, is a, I, I believe, buddies with um, Vice President-elect Pence, um, was, uh, really, was really in favor of this portability <coughs> idea. He wanted to extend it not just to public schools, but to private schools. Um, and I could imagine um, either of those ideas um, getting resurrected. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know, and that makes me think, else, you know, you're feeling bad about the blogs that you wasted the time on? <laughs> think about all the people in the department who spent how many God knows hours on supplement not to plant? <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, bye bye, <laughs> bye bye. Um, so you know, let, let your, I'll just. I think that's that, that's all well said. Well, just on the mandate question, I think to Scott's point, I mean, it's worth noting that Trump, you know, is going to get less smaller popular vote uh, than 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 Hillary Clinton. Uh, the Republicans lost one or two Senate seats in all likelihood. Uh, they lost seven, eight House seats. Um, these losses are much smaller than we anticipated, mm -hmm. um, but still, uh, there's zero evidence of coattails in, in any sense of Trump. So that's worth noting. It's also worth noting, though, that especially when you look at the states, it's not so much, right, we're, we're treating this Trump election, the, 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 the general portrayal on CNN and the Washington Post New York Times is that this is a freakish occurrence. But let's remember, when President Obama was elected, there were 60 Democratic senators at the end of the 08 election. The Democrats had a big majority in the U.S. House. They were in good shape in the states. Today, Republicans have a majority in the House, majority in the Senate, have the White House, have about 34 uh, gubernatorial mansions, have about 60% of the nation's legislative seats in the states. I mean, this is, if you just look at the picture of where the Republicans are in terms of seats held from Washington down to state capitals, this is the strongest the Republican Party has been in a century. And to yet, you know, in the um, post-mortems and the analysis, I haven't seen a hint of that. I mean, I think all of that is being entirely missed in this fascination with, you know, Trump. And, you know, I think, you know, all of us have, a, 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 at least everybody I know, has like 10 things Trump has said or done that we find just abominable and unpardonable. But that actually shouldn't be allowed to obscure some of these much broader political trends that are you know, unfolding in the country. All of you mentioned something that relates to states. And even before the election, no matter who was gonna be president, states had a lot more power on paper than they did uh, under No Child Left Behind and previous laws. So, you're a state chief, what's your ask? Ask? Well, so uh, let me show my cards here some. I work for a State Department of Education. Hey, let's, you, you're cheating because you've already done this. So let's mix this up. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, you first. 
Uh, so I think it depends what kind of state chief I am. I, if I'm a yep. chief who was relying on sort of some of the levers that I had through federal law to get some of my work done, I, I'm worried and I want to ask the Department of Ed to, to help me keep doing this. Give me a, a little bit of backing, make sure that I can keep, keep working on this. If I'm a state chief who either has another strategy or is um, very opposed to some of the, the work the department has done, I, I'm going to say, just leave me alone. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, yeah. I do think that there's a split in, in chiefs about what they actually want from the federal department. Allison, how about you? Um, well, as a reporter, I would just say that um, my ask would be that reporters can sit in on all meetings, <laughs> and, um, see all correspondence, um, and there you go. But you talk to a lot of state chiefs. What do, what um, do you think their reaction is? I haven't. I, I'll be honest. I didn't talk to any state chiefs yesterday, um, and I did kind of get, feel out um, state folks uh, for my Clinton pieces, um, and <laughs> so. Uh, I mean, that, that's a whole other world, so I, I will let you know. What, what, what would have happened if Clinton had won? Give us a couple of the, of the highlights. Of the highlights? So, um, read us the blogs. That read us the, <laughs> I, I'll go get my phone now. <laughs> um, I was actually thinking about putting up my stories just for, yeah. Um, so I think. For history. For history, right. I think um, we would have seen either a secretary of education who was from the higher ed space, and the name I kept hearing was um, Freeman Hrabowski. I don't know what Kim, what you were hearing, but <laughs> it sounds like you were hearing the same things. So you're nodding. Um, and uh, let's see. Um, obviously, there was going to be a lot of pressure on um, Clinton sort of from both sides, uh, whether to keep or, or ditch the um, supplement, not supplant regs, and the accountability regs. I did talk to Randy Weingarten for an interview on Sunday, and she was basically like, I really, you know, she's she's getting rid of that. That's that's going to be gone. And then, you know, I spoke with some more reformy folks, and they were all freaked out about that. And um, I think the unions were really pushing Denise Juno as a potential um, education secretary, and the reformy folks were saying that she peed all over everything Obama did. So that storyline, that union reform storyline, would have been a storyline that I've followed for a while and would have continued to get to follow, and I feel like they're all on the same side of just mourning and crying, as Catherine was saying today. So it's a new storyline, brand new. That's not a bad thing. Gerard, so, the, so in higher ed, there's a state issue here that um, we won't <laughs> see played out. Um, and the Clinton and uh, Clinton had a plan around um, free college, right? It was free college at public universities, um, and but. What wasn't covered much here is that states were going to have to chip in a lot more money to help fund this free college. And this had become a big issue for you know, the insiders in DC. They call it a federal state partnership. States have been disinvesting. They've been cutting funding for higher education. And so the Clinton team and the Sanders team right, were saying, well, we're going to make them do more. Uh, we're going to have them spend a lot more money uh, and provide free college. And you know, the states were in, you know, not in great fiscal shape to be massively expanding their higher education funding. In fact, I think just two days before the election in Virginia, uh, Governor McAuliffe cut funding for higher education, which I thought was, this is amazing, right? Here you have a major Clinton ally, and the senator for that state is running for vice president saying, uh, we need free college, when states need to do more, and the governor is cutting funding mainly because of Medicaid, right? And so we're not going to see how that played out, and that's a whole state issue that I think is now kind of off the table because of this election. Scott, what are you thinking? No, go ahead. In, the, in terms of the state issues? Yep. Um, so. Because you, you were in a position in the Department of Ed to work closely with states and who had to work, of course, with school systems. What, what are you thinking? Right. I mean, I, I think in terms of the the K-12 space, it, it is going to be what, what I said earlier, which is there are a lot of these states that, that really relied on the, the backing of the federal government, and they're going to be struggling here. Um, I mean, I, I think in the <coughs> early childhood space, it, it'll be interesting to see what happens in that um, there's been a lot of partnership between states and the federal government. I think in ESSA, they sort of recognized that that was really important, mm -hmm. um, and that's why there was an early childhood program in ESSA. And I think one of the big questions is going to be, does that partnership continue, or is it sort of a, a rollback to just states and saying that states, they're more of a bully pulpit message. States should invest in, higher ed in early childhood education. We think it's important, but as the federal government, um, we're not going to chip in anything, and we're not going to create a partnership. So big P partnership versus small P. Right. Okay. What are you thinking? Uh, well, I think that early childhood, is, is the period that we talk about is from birth to kindergarten, 
which is when children start school. Children start school in kindergarten. They used to start school in first grade, but now we have kindergarten. Uh, it starts at birth or even prenatal. Um, and I think what's, what's happened over the last 10 years is early childhood has been defined as early childhood education uh, translated then into children starting school when they're four mm -hmm. and now three. And so we have a 13 grade public school system. I think the direction that we were heading was a 14 or even 15 grade public school system. And I think what this is gonna enable us to do is, is take a step back, remember what problem we're trying to solve, and realize that we, are not, we can't solve the problem we're trying to solve through the schools. So to, from my point of view, that's actually a positive development. There's an issue here about unions that I just want to surface as a possibility. So a lot of us have talked about the possible union, anti-union forces on the Democratic side, but think of what could happen on the Republican side now. So um, in the past year, unions teamed up with many Republicans, including conservatives, um, to get ESSA passed. Uh, I think the NEA even gave Lamar Alexander a big award um, for the work that he did on ESSA. Piece one. Piece two. Exit polls show that Donald Trump may have won about half of union households in America and a majority of white union households. Three, he has been saying so much about infrastructure spending. There are a lot of workers in America who like that. All these things put together, you could imagine a scenario where this administration does no, no longer as a Republican administration will have an antagonistic view like reflexively to labor, to union. That's one possibility and that could then um, funnel into what the administration thinks about education policy. The other is the unions backed Hillary Clinton, not just in the general, but hard in the primary. They were all in. And Governor Christie, as the chair or one of the leaders of the transition of the Trump team, um, has a long-term antagonistic relationship with the unions. So an argument could be made from the get-go, the Trump administration will have a hostile relationship with the unions. Either one of those scenarios are possible. Um, but they are very, very different. And I think the team of the transition is gonna to have to think about this. What do we want to, like, how do we set off this relationship for the next four years? I hope somebody right. in the transition's listening. I hope. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah, really. <laughs> I, I, actually, Andy's point there, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask all of us a question. Mm -hmm. who, who do y'all think was, you know, as you reflect on Tuesday, who was the biggest winner in the world of education and who was the biggest loser? I mean, I guess the um, education reformers are the, like, the obvious big, big loser. I mean, they lost in Massachusetts on the charter cap. They lost in Georgia on the school turnaround um, referendum. Um, so that, you know, that's kind of an, they lost, um, well, I guess I, we wouldn't call her an education reformer, but the longest serving um, state chief, June Adkinson, um, was taken out on, uh, on in last Tuesday, and so, or this Tuesday. So, you know, they are definitely, that's definitely a, a, a bucket of folks who lost. Um, biggest winner, I mean, states were already winners and now they're like super winners. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, well, I think the biggest losers are the people who advocated for free college, <laughs> right? I mean, that, that whole movement and this, you know, the complaining about state disinvestment and the new federal state partnership, um, you know, that, I think <coughs> that movement and that concept and that idea, I think that, that's a big loser in this and I, frankly, I think that's good. Um, but in terms of uh, winners, I, you know, I, I'm not sure yet, Rick. I, I, um, it remains to be seen. <laughs> I think it's hard to say in terms of education, winners and losers, because uh, you know, we have no idea what's going to happen now. We, we don't know what the approach is going to be. We don't know what's going to happen in early childhood, in K-12, in higher ed. Um, so I, I think it's probably a little early to pick winners and losers, although I would say that you know, as somebody who did a lot of work for the Obama administration in trying to implement the, our, our agenda, I feel a bit like a loser right now. <laughs> uh, and I'm sure, sure some Not in our eyes, baby. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure some other people feel that way too, uh, because I, I do think it's, uh, it's disappointing that a lot of this stuff has at least the potential of being really rolled back. Um, I mean, I do think that the, the, if I had to pick probably the, the state and local folks who really didn't want any say from Washington and what they were going to do around education are, are the winners. I think the, the tough thing is we don't actually know if that's what's going to play out. Like, uh, I mean, you can say 
Donald Trump said, we need to get rid of the Common Core. If he told states they had to get rid of the Common Core, that would be the biggest intrusion in schooling in history. If he said, you have to get rid of your standards. So I think we don't know who is actually going to be a winner and loser here. Yeah, I mean, I think in early childhood, probably the clearest loser is what I guess I think described as a vision, which I, which I referred to before, which is along the lines of the higher ed thing, that we're going to have universal, free public education for every person from at least we were headed from age three through age whatever it was, 22. Mm -hmm. And then you can only imagine expanding in both directions. Grad school. G yeah, Grad school's next. Yeah. Given, <laughs> given, given the, 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 the really, uh, I would say, failed uh, track record of the K-12 public schools with disadvantaged kids, we've not figured out how to get K-12 schools to serve disadvantaged kids effectively. So until we've done that, I really haven't been supportive of extending its reach in both directions. I, th I think state leaders are probably the biggest beneficiaries here. Um, state superintendents, state boards of education, they're going to have a freer hand uh, on implement implementing the new federal law. And then um, ESSA already was trying to give them more power, and now assuming that this administration is going to even back up from what John King and President Obama wanted to do on the regulatory process, this could be an era where the federal government steps back and st state leaders get to step up, whether that's on CTE or school choice or gifted education or rural schools. The big question mark here is, now that you have all this power, what is this new decentralized zeitgeist of education reform going to look like? Like technocrats lost, DC folks lost, um, a bunch of state leaders won. I just don't know what that amounts to yet. It'll take five years. What do you think? Um, for me, I think big losers are uh, Messers, uh, Duncan, and King. Um, I think they helped set the table for this, and I think an enormous amount of what they've done will be bye-bye. Uh, I think big winners are all those bitter house moms who hated the Common Core. <laughs> Okay. Another possible winner, can I just say this, sure. is Rick wrote this piece several years ago that I commend like as much as I can. But he kind of did this tongue-in-cheek, but it's really important. He pointed out, like, if you cobble together a lot of the executive action, sort of hubristic things that the Obama administration had done, sometimes flirting with whether or not it was illegal or not, you got this playbook of what a forward-leaning administration of any stripe could do. <laughs> Um, and so I think he hypothesized if Ted Cruz won, what maybe Michelle Bachman would do if she were Secretary of Education. Um, and like we all laughed when we read it, but if there, <coughs> Donald Trump were to say to the Secretary of Education, lean into our agenda and use all of the tactics that the Obama administration did, uh, there could be some really interesting things that like make a lot of our jaws drop. Uh, if Rick wants to say more about this, but what I think the Obama administration didn't appreciate is that they weren't just doing tactics, they weren't just doing policy, they were setting precedent in the way the federal government can engage in schools, and that playbook could be used in a way that folks who were happy over the past eight, year, eight years will not be happy in the next four or eight. Allison. So I'm really curious, and I wonder if Scott is grateful now for all of the um, prohibitions on the secretary's role that were included <laughs> in um, the Every Student Succeeds Act. I mean, the secretary is not allowed to do anything on school turnarounds, not allowed to do anything on standards. So even if President Trump's or President elect Trump's education secretary wanted to throw out the Common Core, he or she cannot do that. Um, and ironically, Republicans in Congress are the ones who handcuffed this new Republican education secretary. Um, so I actually think that that has that the blowback has already happened in terms of that precedent. I mean, there may there's other things they, they can do. Apparently, you know, when ESSA came out, people were talking about how there's like this Arnie Duncan's lawyers. There's this river around all of that. Maybe now the Republicans take that <laughs> lawyer river. I don't know and do what they want to do. But um, yeah, I think that. It's already the federal role was was going to be um, in check um, based on whether it was. I think they wrote that assuming it was going to be a Democrat, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think well, I think Congress <laughs> Congress got the message loud and clear on this. Is sort of you know because they're they're there writing legislation without a lot of the details on how some of all this stuff might work. Like, well, yeah, let's let the secretary decide. Yeah, just write that in. Secretary shall decide. And I think now they're all like, ooh, maybe not. Maybe maybe we want to say secretary shall not decide. And they did. Uh, they yeah. did say that. <laughs> and, you know, I think this is part of the fascinating pivot. I mean, on principle, I'm a huge fan of saying, look, it's a big country with more than 300 million people, with 100, 000, more than 100,000 schools in K-12, thousands upon thousands, you know, Four to six thousand institutions of post sec. 
I don't want Washington coming up with one-size-fits-all solutions. Problem is, when you write laws, if one party decides to start engaging in creative interpretation, then it starts to feel like unilateral disarmament if the party doesn't. So I think what we'd like to see, what I'd like to see is ironclad restrictions that stop Washington from going too deep in any of this. But I think part of the concern with the waivers around NCLB, part of the concern we've seen with the creative reinterpretations of Title IX, part of what we've seen well, some of the office, some of the actions out of the Office of Civil Rights, is you, you, you are now at the point where I don't think Trump has ever thought about this stuff in a day in his life. I don't think Obama has ever thought about it very much either. But the people who are going to take jobs in the U.S. Department of Education are no longer confident that there is mutual understanding on both sides that, ex that, that restraint will be exercised. And once one side feels that the other side no longer is party to that agreement, it becomes harder to come up with what I think is a win-win, which is having Washington not overstep its bounds and try to micromanage lives in states and communities and schools and colleges. This gets to Scott's issue <clears throat> about trust earlier. At the end of the day, what Trump administration will do is going to impact, of course, families and children. And there's a lot of discussions now about what executive orders or executive actions will take place. Will they repeal some things? that Obama did in terms of Dear Colleague letters or not. It's going to be a big issue. Where do you see the Dear Colleague letter going with this administration? So I, I think that's a, that's a really tough one. I mean, I think the, the, one of the risks, I think, from, from my perspective is some of the, the things like Dear Colleague letters or executive orders that have been protecting children and families for, for a while, and whether it's deferred action for childhood arrivals. I, I mean, I, I think, Rick, we just disagree on some of the OCR stuff. I mean, I think protecting LGBT kids, protecting um, women in, on college campuses, like a lot of these things are. So Scott, so, but, so let's just go back and forth on that. So I mean, protecting women on college campuses, we all like. Um, requiring colleges to drop the standard of evidence in student hearings to not, right, not, not beyond a reasonable doubt, but to 51% is, strikes me that a, that seems like dubious adjudication for students accused of crimes anyway, and then to have the federal government telling all colleges you're not allowed to use the beyond a reasonable doubt standard. You think that's protecting students. I think that's creating enormous problems of jurisprudence on campus. Yeah, and I think we just have to sort of agree to disagree here because these students aren't being charged with crimes. They're being, being expelled from institutions. They're being permanently black marked. They're, in some cases, being shamed in major media, even we, even when the actual facts of dispute are in doubt. And I think we just we have a, a history of sort of siding with the folks who are um, the we would say accused or the perpetrators in this this situation, and not with the people who are the victims. And I think like flipping that balance is not a bad thing. So, you'll agree with our good friend, the congressman from Colorado, yeah. that you know. If we sometimes unfairly uh, malign or convict a student of a crime they didn't do, that's okay because we're making up for past injustice. So I mean, we're not convicting. No, but these aren't courts of law. Right? So I, I think we. They have, sure aren't. <laughs> <laughs> they sure aren't. Uh, which is the problem. <laughs> Why is that, Jason? But, uh, no, I mean, I mean, that's my point. That this is. But 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 here. But this is. Again, this is sort of strange, right? This is, we're talking about federal policy and about how, you know, just to, to Rick's point, like, what, why is this, like, this shouldn't even be an issue. Like, it shouldn't be part of the federal policy conversation uh, around higher education policy. So, Allison, you've, you've seen this in different administrations. The uh, enforcement mechanisms of OCR? OCR, dear OCR colleague letters, general. just across the issue. Because at some point, the question of how do we treat um, targeted populations, or how do we treat mm -hmm. students? That are, that's going to be a big issue. And traditionally, regardless of which Republican, Republican administrations, it's, ah, they're going to lose civil rights. They're going to lose this. Under Democratic administrations, they'll get more. It's always the almost. I don't know that people would have said that about George W. Bush's administration, honestly. And that's the other yeah. Republican administration that I've covered. Um, I think even now, anytime I talk to Margaret Spellings, um, she frames, and she was the Secretary of Education that I covered under, under the Bush administration. I mean, she frames everything that she did, every decision that she made. You know, I know most of, much of it was controversial. 
um, as protecting, um, you know, of course, historically disadvantaged groups of kids. So it's um, if that's something, and I should ask you, that's something that um, that uh, uh, Trump and his education secretary would want to embrace. They wouldn't be the first Republicans um, to embrace that. This is why there is such a huge difference in, you could have two conservative candidates um, for Secretary of Education who are conservative in different ways. One could be politically conservative. I know the right conservative answers. I may have been a governor, but now I'm Secretary of Education. I'm going to force my answer, my conservative answer, down on all the states. That is a model that uh, Mr. Trump may decide to take. The other is what some people call dispositionally conservative or temperamentally conservative. There's a humility to it. Yes, I'm in a position of power, but that doesn't mean I have all the wisdom. Actually, lots of smart people are out there. They're practitioners. They know their communities a whole lot better. So the posture I ought to take is small, gradual, incremental community-based developments and evolutionary change. Therefore, even if I know what I think the right answer is, as a posture, I'm going to say, let's allow states and districts and schools to try to figure this out. Both are conservative, um, but they're very different in their answers to some of these questions. And I'm just not sure yet, or I don't even know if a president like Trump is sure yet which of those models he's going to take. But again, there's a big difference between them. Um, in terms of the trust issue, I, 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 I have a feeling that some people are hearing what what's people are, some people are up here saying uh, as sort of statements of values and morals, and I and I and, but what I mean by that is I think we've gotten to a point in Washington or where we use certain approaches, uh, centralized approaches, actually big government regulation in D.C., big government programs coming out of D.C. as kind of a proxy for morality, a kind of a proxy for what we care about. And so I'm just realizing that when I said that thing about the not expanding K-12, people are going to be hearing me saying that I am pleased that the Trump administration does not care about little children. And I can assure you that I will be doing everything I can to make sure that's not the case. Because I think what we need to be doing is focusing much more on our, on our shared values and our common goals rather than skipping immediately to one solution or the other. Uh, so I, I think that is, that's part of the trust issue, is we've yeah. developed a kind of a shorthand for talking about what, what we care about. Uh, and we haven't been very uh, transparent about that for a long time. So I'll throw out one more question for the uh, panel, and then we'll open it up to the audience. So under Reagan, there was one type of conservatism. And his name has come up a lot during the campaign of, I'm a Reagan standard bearer. Uh, George W. Bush had the compassionate conservatism part. What does conservatism mean now for education in a Trump administration? Sure. sure. Can I actually start with that? So first, I think, you know, I think the Reagan example is illustrative. Those of us who are old enough will remember the abject horror and terror which, to which the country awoke the day after Reagan's election. Uh, he was a racist. Um, just as Kanye West explained that George W. Bush didn't care about poor, poor people or black people, uh, Margaret's efforts notwithstanding. Um, I think part of, part of the backdrop for this uh, is when we talk about what, what, what is a conservative, what's a conservative administration, um, is frankly, those of us who are conservative have gotten so used to being labeled racist, classist, uncaring, imperialistic, that these words have ceased to actually have much meaning. So when the New York Times and the Washington Post and CNN think they are reprimanding the nation in the course of a campaign, a lot of people have tuned it out because these words don't actually mean anything to 30 or 40 percent of the country anymore. So I think that's one. So some of these exchanges, for instance, when we talk about the federal government's role in protecting populations, you know, if you talk to folks who run religious schools, for instance, religious colleges, uh, what feels to folks at OCR and, and Obama Department of Education like protecting um, certain students feels to the other folks like a massive violation of free exercise of religion under the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, that they're not even allowed to have biologically based assignment to dormitories. So I think what's conservatism in this election? I think it's a couple of things. One, I think it's a sense that the federal government ought to have a more restrained role of its mission in American life. That the fact that so many people are crying 
or distraught over the election of somebody who's going to serve four years in an administrative position uh, in one-third of the U.S. federal government overseeing bureaucrats in one part of the federal system feels like a disproportionate response to part of the machinery of living together. That I think one kind of conservatism, which I hope Trump will embrace, is that the president will not become some one or something in which we vest all our hopes. He will become part of the machinery of government, which is one of the things that free people need to live. Is that going to be the kind of conservatism we get? I think that's an open question. Yeah. Allison. So um, obviously, um, Trump's biggest proposal on K-12, at least, was this $20 billion school choice proposal. We don't know where the money's going to come from. There are some details to be worked out on that. Um, but I did talk to um, Luke Messer, who was the congressman who pushed um, Title I portability for private schools um, and public schools uh, prior to the election, I think actually in Cleveland. And um, he told me that he really did not want to see the next Republican president um, embrace the idea of a federal department of school choice. And so I think if um, the Trump administration does embrace that idea, um, it sounds like at least some of the people that I would imagine that being their allies in Congress on that or potentially even serving in their administration um, want to be very cognizant of what the federal role should look like there. Uh, well, I mean, I, I think that, you know, at least with respect to education and, and higher education in particular, you know, the, the, the conservatives and the Republicans, um, they got a lot of contradictions to sort out. Uh, and, and I'm hoping that, that this is a, a fresh chance to sort some of those out. So, for example, um, you know, if you want to have a big school choice program, but you also want to get rid of the Department of Education, it's a problem. <laughs> uh, if you, you know, want to get rid of student loans, but want to expand income-based repayment in the student loan program, that's a problem. Uh, if you want to let uh, states and local school districts choose um, and make decisions on their own, you can't ban Common Core. Um, you got to let them decide. And yeah, so, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. so that's so this is, idea what it would mean to ban Common Core. <laughs> right. You but can't. Right. Okay. The law says that's you right. can't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so I think this is, you know, this is an opportunity to, to, to really kind of figure out what that does mean and, and sort some of those things out. Um, and, and, and Find places where there are these sort of strange contradictions. I mean, you know, conservatives haven't haven't invested a lot in what their higher education agenda and platform should be, and I think this is a great opportunity to to really start thinking hard about that. Yeah, I do think to to that point, it's it's sort of a, a mystery what conservative conservatism means to Donald Trump. I think, like he, I mean, his proposals in a lot of areas, I mean, not, maybe not specifically education, but aren't traditionally conservative or Progressive, exactly. Like they, but things like infrastructure investment, that is not a conservative proposal. Um, the, he's talking about massive investments, something like yeah. that. I mean, the, the trade uh, deals that he's talking about, those getting rid of, get rid of free trade is not a conservative traditional position. I, I think, again, back to the point that we were all making at the beginning, we just don't know what any of this means. And I think, um, you know, as somebody who's working on the, the progressive side of things, I think it's we are trying to figure out like how we make sure that those ideas and the, and those policy proposals sort of continue to have some some traction because I think again we don't know where President elect Trump where his Department of Education where the rest of his administration is actually going to fall on a lot of these things mm -hmm. thoughts um, I, I have a, a thought that was just provoked by this. I think one of the reasons that Trump won is because uh, most of the Amer a lot of the American public, are sick of ideologues. Um, so this sort of, well, is it pure this or pure that? I mean, a lot of the American public isn't operating that way. One of my big concerns coming out of this election is that something develops along the lines of a kind of a left-wing Tea Party. That is a more intense, uh, kind of ideologically driven thing than, than, than uh, or at least as much as, 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 as what other, ki other kinds of uh, approaches have, have made people really nervous. So I, I mean think- like the Sanders campaign. <laughs> yeah, I was, gonna, yeah. I was gonna show you one that might already exist, but. <laughs> so I just think that's something, I am hoping very, very much that my progressive colleagues in, in DC, that we, 
we can try to do everything we can to make sure that doesn't happen because that's going to be counterproductive. A left-wing Tea Party that just is morally, you know, outraged and, and, and devastated and, 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 and exercising the truth, you know, in every way that it can, fighting and fighting, that's just not going, to, that's going to backfire the way similar efforts on the right have, I think, not been constructive. Uh, so I think that sort of trying to move away from ideology, ideology and trying to think more about our shared goals, what we're trying to do and how we can get them done is, would be a very positive thing that could come out of this election. I generally think of conservatism, like just based on this one question, who do you trust with power, and as I understand conservatism, as I, I embrace it, like there, there are two options. They're binary often. Like, do you trust tradition, longstanding customs that have developed over time? Is there wisdom there, or do you think new, modern, technologically savvy things give you the answer? Do you trust local and state governments because you believe in decentralization, or do you think it's best to centralize things, especially in the federal government? Do you believe that incremental change, slow, evolutionary, is the best way to go about this, or do you think that like um, grand experts with big schemes that like happen swiftly are the best way to do things? Um, and most importantly of all is a civil society question. Do you think that the wide array of nonprofit organizations that represent the differences in America, um, nonprofits acting in the civil space, they can do it building up social capital or do you want state controlled government bodies that have all of these answers? Like the first in all four of those means that you're humble, that you're modest about all of our abilities and you want to decentralize and you want to empower other people. If you're really certain about your answers, you want to answer the second on all of those. If I got the answers, I want to centralize. I want to be in charge of the federal government. I want swift plans to happen. So I know in each of these cases as a state policymaker, I want to lean towards the first. But you could see the case in this administration thinking that I am the one who can solve America's problems. Maybe the decision in a lot of these cases, let's use the federal government, let's use swift plans, let's not decentralize things too much. And I think this is going to be the big philosophical question for the administration. Do you believe in this temperamental, decentralizing, trusting conservatism, or we got the power, we're going to fix it ourselves with our friends who are in positions of authority? And Trump's not giving a lot of signals on the, uh, the first. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn it over to the audience. Uh, for those of you who are watching by live stream, we have hashtag 2016 education. Uh, feel free to send in a question. We have two rules here at AEI. Number one, uh, state your name and where you work. Number two, ask a question, not give a speech. And so we want to make sure that happens. I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to start right left since we can go here. I'll start in the front and then I'll move over. Thank you. Oh, comes to mic. And we have a microphone oh, here. Thank you. Thank and one on this side. Thank For you. the millions of people watching online, otherwise we won't be able to hear you. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Thank you very much. My name's Eileen Rosenthal. I'm the CEO of a company called Footsteps to Brilliance. It's an early learning company. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to speak to three different superintendents who work in urban schools. And they, all three of them separately, told me that they're having a major issue in their schools after the election because so many of them are dealing with children who are undocumented. And those children are coming to school crying, not sure whether the feeling is somebody's going to storm in and take them, or alternatively, whether they'll go home and not find their parents. What do you think is going to happen with respect to that, since we do have so many undocumented students in our schools right now? Okay. Who wants to take that question? <laughs> I'll do it. Um, look, I don't remember anybody I can't remember a single angsty story uh, after um, Obama uh, announced DACA, for instance, about those families that felt illegal uh, immigrants are coming into their communities, uh, transforming their communities, taking jobs, creating uh, life difficult. In fact, to even raise this issue was to risk being painted as a xenophobe or a racist. We're a nation of laws. These children are here illegally. They are absorbing resources that cannot be spent on children who live here legally. I think we are, in the history of the world, and if you look across the world, an exceptionally humane nation. But look, one of the reasons I think Donald Trump won was he was willing to express what I think a great many Americans feel is frustration with an unwillingness 
to talk frankly about the fact that people who were in the United States illegally are here illegally, and that that's an issue, and it creates an issue for citizens. Um, if we had expressed more sympathy for citizens who were concerned about this in schools, I would say let's also have the other half of the conversation. But given that schools have shown remarkably little interest in the other half of the conversation, other than trying to make sure that these children are, you know, I mean, if they need counseling, if they need somebody to talk to, that's fine. I don't want to see schools uh, make a priority um, reorganizing their instructional uh, focus or the practice uh, in order to make comfortable children whose families are not legally in the United States. Catherine? Yeah. Um, so th this, is, this, is, this, is, this is such a tough issue for me. My head agrees with Rick uh, completely. My heart just hurts. Um, so I think, I don't know what the answer is because this is absolutely not my area of expertise. I can only imagine that there's ways of approaching this issue that, that get at what Rick's talking about while minimizing damage to existing little kids. So I'm just hoping that, that really smart people in the Trump administration figure out some creative ways of doing that and that they're supported by the Congress in, in taking humane approaches with the bottom line being what, what, what Rick has said. Okay. So the, I would, just really quick, I mean, the sure. only thing I would want to add is that it is a long-standing Supreme Court precedent that children of undocumented immigrants who are undocumented immigrants themselves are entitled to a free public education. Absolutely. So I think it is absolutely 100% true that schools need to respond to their needs. That is their job, is they should respond to the needs of every kid in their school. So I, I think that is something that we need to keep in mind. These are children that, by Supreme Court ruling, are entitled to the same public education as everybody else. Question over here. Jennifer Laszlo Mizrahi, mm -hmm. and I wanted to ask about children with disabilities. I'm the president of respectability. Um, only 61% of children with disabilities are graduating. Uh, we have 750,000 people with disabilities who are incarcerated. What do you think the Trump administration will do to ensure that students with disabilities can become workforce ready? Okay. Uh, so Scott? one thing I would say here is that there's been, I think IDEA and, and the uh, and support for kids and people with disabilities is an area where there has been bipartisan agreement sort of historically that we need to invest in supporting kids with disabilities, invest more in IDEA. So uh, it's sort of my, my hope would be that that is something that we have an area of common ground on and that we see in Congress and across the administration. But um, it's it's hard to know at this point. Um, you know, I, mean, I think one, you know, children with special needs, obviously, uh, a number of states, God, I don't even know the numbers, starting with the McKay Scholarship in Florida, have offered these families options uh, if they feel their kids are not well served uh, through the traditional IEP process in district schools. Uh, one, you can certainly imagine uh, a Trump administration trying to create more leeway for states uh, to use both IDEA funds and Title I to create options uh, for those families and children. Uh, a second is part of just generally thinking about career and technical education. And again, to Scott's point, I think this has been a bipartisan area of interest, is how do you create both in K-12 and in post-sec kind of career and technical ed options that actually are going to equip folks with all kinds of needs and all kinds of circumstances uh, for employment? And I think if you look, for instance, at what uh, you know, Senators Rubio and Lee have talked about uh, on higher ed reform and some of the room for new models of uh, delivery through programs like General Assembly, and how do you think about accreditation and how that creates obstacles, that I think the Trump administration could, if you have the right people in the department and the interest on Capitol Hill, open some doors to really interesting conversations. Mm -hmm. Young lady back here. Hello, my name is Shana Cook. I'm from New America. Um, was interested in um, seeing your, or hearing your thoughts on whether the Trump administration would have any interest in um, Head Start reauthorization, and if so, what could that look like? Thank you. Okay. Okay. Everybody's looking at one person. Shannon, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't actually know how to answer that question, and, and the reason I say that is, uh, from what I understand, Head Start is sort of this sacred space in Washington that people from both parties are, have, have, have been reluctant to, to kind of address. 
It's a lot of money. It's $9 billion. I cannot believe that that money is being used as effectively as possible for the kids that use it the most. It's been a, it's a giant, giant federal program. Uh, I have called for allowing states to experiment with that money in ways that are held to really high standards that the states are defining and sub subject to rigorous evaluation. Uh, that would be the direction that I would be interested, is just letting, just let, let's like opening up some uh, without without losing the commitment to the most disadvantaged kids that, that, that Head Start's been upholding for 50 years. So what's years. the likelihood that a Trump administration zeroes out Head Start? I think that's, I cannot imagine that happening. I think that's going to be, I don't think that would happen. Okay. This side of the room. Here. Yep. Your microphone's coming your way. Hi, I'm Kim Heffling with Politico. I was wondering if each of you could comment a little bit more about what you anticipate will be happening in the Office for Civil Rights in the remaining days of the Obama administration on these issues such as bathroom access and these pending investigations involving uh, campus sexual assault related issue and also what you anticipate will happen in a, the Trump administration on day one. Is the office gone or do you see more of a slow shift on these types of investigations and issues? Right, jump in. Well, I, I'm just going to throw something out there that um, uh, happened at the end of the um, Clinton administration uh, that that might be in, uh, of interest to folks. There's something called the Congressional Review Act, um, which basically allows uh, Congress to do a fast track, filibuster proof, up or down vote on any new regulations. Um, and this strikes me as something that many people in Washington should be familiarizing themselves with right now, <laughs> is how this law works. Uh, because it's a very convenient way for getting rid of regulations that you disagree with without having to start a whole new rulemaking process. Yeah. I do think to the, the question about some of the LGBT protections in particular, like a lot of those are in the courts right now. So this is actually not something that is entirely dependent on the, the, the department's guidance um, and I think th those are things we'll see playing out over the, the next couple of months to uh, a year. Yeah, so a couple of things here. I think one, Scott's point's exactly right. It's useful for folks to understand which of these are actually the products, process, um, outcome of judicial processes and which were a guidance letters or OCR actions. Um, and there's a distinction there. Uh, a second is, look, I mean, on the LBGT question, uh, there's zero evidence that Trump is fundamentalist in any way in a religious sense. Uh, he's gone out of his way to express, you know, broad support. Um, and I mean, let's remember that really, really Giuliani, uh, you know, there's great photographs of him and all kinds of stuff which would suggest <laughs> Rudy is LGBT friendly. Uh, so, you know, I, th I, th I think it's, uh, you know, I think there's tends to be a hysteria factor in some of this when it gets talked about in Washington and New York. Um, but, but, but the issue, the point is, that whether, however one feels about specific LBGT questions, there's the question about whether the federal government has overreached, either in telling all states and localities the right way to go about these things, and in particularly in issuing guidance that even applies to religious schools and colleges. And I think you can absolutely expect that a new Republican administration, any Republican administration, including Trump's, not because of who's president, but because of the people who will be coming into these positions, are going to scrutinize this stuff revisit it, um, what role OCR will play, whether it will be consolidated, whether its wings will be trimmed, is I think a big question. Uh, the Obama team has very consciously made uh, OCR something like a policy lever, um, partly because it couldn't get anything through the legislative branch. Uh, I think you can be certain that OCR will be downsized and be less prominent uh, in a Trump administration. Beyond that, I think that we're going to have to all wait and watch to see how the transition team and the appointees choose to move forward. Uh, gentleman here. Uh, David Griffith with ASCD. Um, so I think Rick made note the, the Congress is under Republican control. The White House will be under Republican control. Uh, the Congress is a, a bit more of a known quantity. So I guess my question is, over the next two years, what are the what is most likely of the Trump platform to move in Congress that would be acceptable or or you know want to be passed? And and are there are there any issues that are are would be a problem for 
for Congress and congressional leaders. And also mindful, I mean, I can't believe I'm saying this two days after the election, but thinking about the historical trends of mid-year, uh, midterm elections and what that portends for the Congress, what, you know, what do you see as, you know, what's going to be either fast-tracked or moved and what is a non-starter for Chairman Alexander, potential so, Chairman Allison, Fox? you want to start us off? Um, <coughs> That's a great question. I think we're still unpacking this. I would imagine, I think people have already said it, that HEA is a, is a likely place um, that the, the new Congress will start, um, partly just because if you were going to have a Chairman Alexander and a chairman, <laughs> Chairwoman Fox, that's where they would have started anyway, even if it was with Hillary Clinton. Um, I wonder if they can remove Perkins reauthorization um, I, I can't. I don't. I don't see why they would move it in the lame. Like it just doesn't make sense that they would move it, considering this configuration of players in the lame duck. Um, maybe if it had been this was in my Clinton story. Um, maybe if it had been a, a Clinton um, Clinton presidency, that that might have been uh, something that they they would have moved quick in the lame duck. But um, I think they'll start over on that, and that does um, some of the themes of of career and technical education. Um, maybe does uh, feed into um, some of what uh, you know, Mr. Trump talked about on the campaign trail. Um, and in terms of the infrastructure program, which we've talked about, I wonder if school construction might be a part of that. Um, and it would be really ironic, right? Um, Barack Obama <coughs> tried to get school construction into his um, economic stimulus, and like Republicans like walked out of the room. I think Senator Voinovich like walked out of the room over, over school construction. Um, over the labor issues, though. Yeah, over the labor, labor issues, school issues, school construction. So Davis Bacon, point. yeah. So I wonder, I mean, yes, they'll have a trouble dealing, dealing with the, yeah, you're right, you have to deal with the whole Davis-Bacon issue. So yes, that'll, that would be a problem. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if there was some money. I mean, he's talked about we can't build a, and we, we went back and forth in the Education Week uh, newsroom about whether we could use the, the word that he, the expletive that he used to describe, but we can't build a blank school in Brooklyn. Um, so I think you know, it's something that he might be thinking about, and that could be an area for bipartisanship, okay. maybe. Oh, maybe then I'll go to Andy. No, Rick. Uh, go ahead. Okay, uh, a couple specific points. Um, one, uh, I think most m most of the Trump agenda, uh, as the papers have pointed out, isn't going anywhere. Uh, there's not the votes in Congress. They've got maybe 52, 53 in the Senate. So you need 60 to move like some of the big radical stuff he's talked about. Um, what is so that's one. Two, what is going to move some specific pieces? Uh, they're going to move something like uh, early childhood tax credit, some version of that. You can absolutely see moving. Uh, you can absolutely see moving, uh, as has been said several times, HEA. Though, as Jason's noted, Trump has come out like four different places on student loans. So like, which version of that administration will push? You know, who actually knows? Um, third, well, let's keep in mind exactly how far back in the queue education's gonna be. Uh, <laughs> the, the, I mean, right, Congress is gonna start, there's gonna be a Supreme Court seat to fill. Uh, there, uh, the Iran agreement will probably be torn up. Um, there's going to be probably a push for a huge tax cut package where Congress will be sympathetic, although it'll get reworked. Um, so stuff, for instance, that can find its way into a tax cut package will move. But a lot of this other stuff is likely to be backseated, certainly out of the first 100 days and probably out of the first year. Uh, in the midterms, I mean, it, it's relevant because it'll affect calculations. Two quick thoughts on this. One, this, remember, was the Senate election that Republicans hate. Yeah. They were defending 24 seats. The next two Senate elections, Next two Senate elections, 2018 and 2020, 36 Democratic seats up, only 30 Republican seats. So Republicans are actually on offense all the way through 2020 in the Senate. In the House, uh, Republicans lost a couple of the easy to lose ones. Uh, presidential party always faces backlash in the off cycle year, but Republicans also tend to do better off cycle. So part, you know, part of the calculation here is on the Republican side, is they're not necessarily fearing that they're going to lose Congress in 2018. So, so let me just say something uh, uh, related to what Rick said about you need 60 votes to do these things, right? But also talking about a tax package. If you do a budget reconciliation bill, you need a simple majority in the Senate. Uh, and I would imagine... Hello, Obamacare. That's right. Mm -hmm. that's, and this is how Obamacare got enacted. Um, but uh, in every single reconciliation bill that has passed since 2005, there have been changes to student loans on it, right? And so I would imagine that budget reconciliation becomes the vehicle for a big tax package, a repeal and replace of Obamacare, and 
HEA reauthorization. I forgot to mention HEA, didn't I? And I was like, we're busy 100 days. Yeah. Oh, yeah, repeal and place will be in there, too. <laughs> sure. Andy. Yeah, um, three quick thoughts on this. One is, to your point, you were um, uh, a little bit vague about it, but just so everyone understands, like the point that you made about, uh, I think only in 1934 and in 2002 are the only examples of a midterm election where the president's party did not lose seats in Congress. So we have to assume, with Rick's point in mind that Republicans have an advantage this time, that the small majority that we, the Republicans have in the Senate and a little bit bigger in the House is going to either go away or be considerably smaller in two years from now. So that leads to question two. In the next two years, what are you going to spend your limited political capital on and try to get done in this very short window knowing that all your power may go away after the midterm? If you think of all of the things Rick listed, where are, where are those education issues? How much political capital are they actually going to be willing to spend on these things given those other things? I'm, I'm skeptical. And so I don't know what the answer on this is, but I would say look for four different signals. Number one is who is the Secretary of Education that they're going to pick. That will tell you a lot about temperament and directionally, higher ed, early childhood, school choice, that's number one. Number two is the big one, which is the first budget submission that this administration will give. It'll happen probably in February, maybe in March. This is where the administration will forecast what its big ask of Congress is. Maybe a lot of money for school choice, maybe for early childhood. That ask will tell us a lot. Um, the third is, does the president just tell the Secretary of Education, um, I want you to do something <coughs> on ESSA. I want you to do something on civil rights. We, who knows? Any of that kind of stuff could happen. And the last one is State of the Union. Does he dedicate um, the process for putting together a, a State of the Union address is actually not like beautiful, it's like tactical. And so staffers in the White House and the departments are constantly fighting to get a sentence in the State of the Union, a paragraph in the State of the Union. The question is, in his first State of the Union, is there a paragraph, a sentence, a word about an education priority? So all of those things will be done by, call it mid-March, and I think we will know a whole lot more by then. But prior to that, this is conjecture territory. Andy, signal, uh, signal your first signal. And I'd love to hear everybody's thoughts. Who, who, who would you like to see as Secretary of Ed? And who do you think will be Secretary of Ed? So let me do this. I've got a couple of people on this side who had their hands up, and then we'll get back to that one. Go ahead. All right. <laughs> Thanks for rescuing me. Uh, Joe McTighe from CAPE, which is Religious and Independent Schools. In terms of the uh, freelance imposition of ideology, as we heard, people can oppose it either because they think the wrong ideology is being Im imposed or because they believe in subsidiarity and letting those uh, laboratories of democracy work it out. The poster child for all this has been the uh, transgender bathroom mandate. And uh, it's an issue that locals can work out with compassion and sensitivity and common sense, given the opportunity. But do you think the Trump administration, Justice Department, and Education Department will quickly rescind that? And if so, for what reasons? The bad ideology reason or the subsidiarity reason? Sure. I have two, two very quick thoughts. One is, well, three thoughts. One is I have absolutely no idea. This is like crystal ball stuff. The signal is who's going to be the assistant secretary for civil rights and some of these other uh, assistant secretaries who will actually be like in the weeds of trying to figure this out. That's like a big, big signal. Something that few people I think appreciate is there's generally this narrative that a new administration comes in and wipes the slate clean of all of the stuff the previous administration did. So I was at the end of the Bush administration leading into Obama administration. Two things that they kept that really surprised me. One was TIF, the Teacher Incentive Fund. This was like a Margaret Spellings era uh, teacher. It ended up being teacher evaluation, but it was really <laughs> performance pay. They could have zeroed that out. They could have killed that. But they actually like re-embraced it, turned it into something else. But it just shows that sometimes continuity will surprise you. I also had been working on this issue that you know of, faith-based schools, um, low-income kids. The, early in the administration, the Obama administration could have killed that. They didn't. They held a meeting. They thought more about it. This is all to say these are anecdotes of a bigger story, which is don't assume that everything, even hot button, of previous administration gets wiped away. There are going to be individual decisions made by high-ranking officials, not always a secretary, who are going to say, you know, let's keep this for a while, or let's amend it, let's not get rid of it. Just don't think it's going to be binary, old, new. There's a lot of um, fluidity in between. Anyone else want to weigh in? Nope, nice. 
I got a question on this side. Yes. <coughs> Hi, thanks, Lisa Guernsey at New America. Um, going back to your point, Andy, about the budget request, I'm curious as to whether or not the infrastructure push may then overshadow requests for uh, funding related to any of these education issues and whether that means that questions around even block grants to states or just even what states might even have to work with would be, um, whether it would kind of curtail the amount that would be available to them because the amount would go into infrastructure, maybe it goes into school construction instead, I don't know, but I'm kind of curious what, um, what you might foresee in terms of how some of that budget request uh, pulls together. So this is the inside baseball yeah. of yeah. that's really interesting and is always hidden. What the administration l will probably do along with OMB, and few of you like will ever heard of who the MB OMB head is, but that's a really important position, or the education leader within OMB. <coughs> they will tell the US Department of Education, present us with a budget that is 3% below your current budget, 1% below your current budget, 1% above your current budget. Department develops that thing with its agenda in mind, and that ends up getting adjudicated by the White House, its staff, DPC, OMB, and then that gets part of this much bigger discussion of how much money do we actually have, where do we distribute it across all the different departments. I will be shocked if this administration decides that of like the budget woes and everything else they want to do, that the US Department of Education is going to have a bigger budget in its request than it currently does. So I would expect that the question is going to be what gets cut and um, what gets preserved. So any of these new programs, unless I'm unless there's some grand program on school choice, like this infrastructure stuff and other things, it's probably gonna be part of the minus category. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, one thing we haven't talked about yet is sequestration, right? So that's gonna be in place until 2021, technically, which is the end of the Trump administration. You mean the spending caps? The spending caps, the right, spending the caps. spending caps, thank you, um, for, for the sequester. So there's been an elusive, it's been elusive, this budget deal. I think it's not gonna be so elusive anymore. Um, I think that uh, one of the first things that we may see is um, the new Congress and the new president figure out a way to um, change or lift the spending caps only for defense spending, I would expect, um, if they can get that through the Senate, um, or significantly relax them for defense spending, um, whereas um, NDD, non-defense non discretionary spending, which is where all the education um, programs where all that lives, um, I would think this is a, a dark time. Well, I would, but I would just, I would just ask, yeah, though, how many times has the Republican-controlled Congress voted to raise the caps? in the past few years? Is it like four or five? Yeah, yeah, but I mean, <laughs> so, they kind of had to. It was right, a divided government, right? right? It was like gonna shut down otherwise, so I would also say now to, not so much. To, to cheer my progressive friends, yeah. I would also say, right, Trump has given zero evidence of giving a lick about the national debt. Um, he's proposed- He actually did mention this. He did talk he did talk about He's proposed massive semester. tax cuts. He's proposed increasing Social Security payouts. So I, mean, I think what you're gonna see is a real, you, you, you're likely to see um, a split on the right between uh, yeah. deficit hawks yeah. and people are like, screw it, let's spend more money. <laughs> and depending on who wins and how the deals come together, you could actually, so I, I think that we've been talking, you know, Allison, you pointed to like how one of the narratives on the left uh, under Clinton would have been like an education between, uh, you know, the, the, the teacher unions and the reformers. Mm -hmm. I think one of the splits y'all will be seeing emerge on the right is between the people who want to spend a lot of money, spend more on entitlements, cut taxes, and the people who are worried about the national debt. And that's gonna have real implications for, for programs. Yes. yes. So we've got two minutes left, Rick. You raised a question before I wanted to get to yes. the first audience. <coughs> Great closing question. I'd, like, I'd love to have Andy start, actually. Uh, the question of who should be secretary. Who should be secretary and who will be secretary. So I think probably the next secretary will be um, a former or sitting governor. Um, which I'm not quite sure. Um, so I would like that or probably a current or former state superintendent. Um, someone like Jim Pizer up in Massachusetts, someone like um, Paul Pasterak who had been in Louisiana. Uh, someone whose disposition and experience, temperament, leads them to say no matter what grand scheme conservatives in Washington DC have, someone who will sit in that seat and say that's a great idea, that doesn't mean that Uncle Sam has to push it. Um, and I think only if you have been in the weeds of knowing what state governments go through, what their constitutional responsibilities are, what the day-to-day -day work is, you can actually, if you are not from one of those positions, um, you can get um, pulled into this idea of, ooh, great idea, let's have the federal government advance this. So state leader is my hope. Catherine. Catherine? 
Um, this is not my area of expertise. Okay. Scott. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I actually agree with Andy on the sort of state leader. I, I think that is something that would be both my my hope and my prediction. Um, I think some of the best secretaries of education have been former governors uh, and the folks that have done a lot, um, you know, folks from the right and from the left. So I, I would be excited to, to see somebody like that who, ha a governor who has made education a priority. I think that'll be the key. You could have a governor uh, who comes in who has made sort of cutting education a priority and that will send a very different signal, uh, which I would be worried about. And I do think there's opportunity for a, a strong state chief to, to be named. Again, I think this will depend on uh, how much a President Trump really cares about education uh, personally or how much he wants to delegate to the to the department. And if he names somebody who is from the business from outside education, I think that might send a signal that he has a particular vision for this that is not education related. And um, I would hope that he would put somebody in there who, again, is an education focused former governor or a, a former state. Okay, so is it prediction first, hope second? Sure. Okay, yeah. First, prediction <laughs> second. Okay, uh, Jeb Bush and Mitch Daniels. Or, what, or is it Mitch Daniels? Jeb Bush. <laughs> Those two. I like it. Yeah. So my hope is um, a uh, quotable secretary. Um, <laughs> who, um, well, coming back. <laughs> yeah. Open who, um, conferences. Yeah, who uh, values especially the wonky trade press and um, lets us in on, on all decisions. Um, and my best guess, I think this the state leader is, is a good guess. Um, I would also throw out, I mean, because we had nothing to go on we, we, uh, before this, I mean, the insider survey mentioned um, Ben Carson as, as a possibility. It was something that uh, Trump fo uh, floated in a debate that, that um, Ben Carson is somebody that he listens to. Um, Bill Evers obviously is part of the transition team. I feel like I don't know with the with I think this is gonna, I think education is going to be Pence's area, and um, I think that we could get somebody from see somebody from Indiana. So mm. Mitch Daniels is maybe not the worst guess, um, mm. and uh, or Luke Messer, or uh, maybe even Tony Bennett, mm. former Indiana chief. Okay, Mitch Daniels, you heard it here first. That's okay, <laughs> we're getting up early. You know, see, but, but, but I, I like this Bill Bennett thing. It's part of the whole Space Cowboys yeah. motif. New Gingrich, Rudy Giuliani, <laughs> Bill Bennett. You can see them sitting around playing canasta. And talk. <laughs> but, uh, Who do you think? You didn't so uh, you know, if I, I, I like the state. I want somebody who's been relentless uh, under fire, who's not going to be intimidated by uh, angry editorials in the Washington Post and the New York Times. Somebody who's faced, who's fought for choice, who delivered their state, um, a purple state for Trump. So Scott Walker uh, has, I think, would be an interesting pick. One of the added bonuses. Uh, if you're conservative, is that it manages to give conniptions to both the teacher unions and the Reform Democrats, which would be kind of interesting. Uh, me, if, as far as what I'd like to see, I saw a name floated in Politico just yesterday that I thought would be intriguing. I know, I, I know the person would be of, you know, f sophistication and thoughtful and high character. Uh, and, and so, Gerard, I think, uh, <laughs> I think you'd make a hell of a pick, but. Unless my boss is trying to get rid of me. I don't know how to take that. <laughs> <laughs> so with that said, I want to thank all of you for coming to today's event. And I'd like to end with one thing. Families and children are expecting adults who are in positions of power to do the responsible thing. And we have an opportunity to move beyond what's right and what's left. And let's just make sure that we do what's just. And so with that, I look forward to more conversations. And let's give a hand to our panelists. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>